We're going to be talking for a while here with an epidemiologist and public health expert, uh, Dr. Sharice Rohr Allegrini is with the San Antonio, uh, she is the San Antonio program director for the Immunization Partnership. And uh, we're going to uh, get as many questions answered as we can that I have and that you may have. And uh, Dr. Allegrini, it's great to have you. Thanks for making time for us. I know this is a busy time, but we appreciate having you. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, and you know, I think a lot of people uh, who are trying to be very calm and very responsible about this, and they don't want to uh, overreact. But what's interesting is this is all playing out right overlaid or overlaying the allergy season in San Antonio. So I think a lot of people in in today and in the days ahead are going to have the question, if I don't feel so good, how do I tell the difference between possible coronavirus or allergy symptoms that I've had before or maybe that I haven't had before? Right. Yeah, I have allergies too, so I hear you. Um, the, the thing is to call your doctor if you're concerned. Um, 87% of the cases of COVID have fever along with the coughing. So um, if you don't have a fever, you can relax a little bit. I'd still call your doctor to talk about it and to see what the next steps are. If you've never had allergies before or the symptoms are very different, that could be concerning. And again, uh, you know, call your primary care provider to discuss it. I don't recommend going in without calling first uh, mm -hmm. because if you are infectious, they might have a different course of action for you. Mm -hmm. Is there any thought to sort of giving it a little time, seeing if your usual allergy, you know, whatever it is you usually do to alleviate your allergy symptoms works? It really depends on what your situation is. If you are somebody that falls into the high risk group, so you're, you're over 65, you um, have other medical conditions that uh, might put you at risk, like being immunocompromised, um, then you probably don't want to wait. But if you're an otherwise healthy young adult, Take your, take your allergy meds, see if that helps to clear it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't wait too long. I'd still call your right. doctor as soon as you can. And would this advice change at all if, because we don't, most of us don't live, you know, in a bubble, would this advice yeah. change at all if we had in our household, so maybe we're not in the high-risk group, but we had someone in our household who is? Sure, that does change if you're in that situation. If you've got somebody close to you in your home or you're taking care of somebody like an elderly parent or an immunocompromised child, then you want to, you know, your, your own health, you're not likely to be at risk for developing severe disease, but you could be infecting somebody else in the house. So you're going to want to act sooner. All right. Uh, as we take uh, calls for Dr. Allegrini, phone number is 210-599-5555. Let's pick up line one and Brian uh, has a question here on KTSA. Hi, Brian. Hey, Jack. Thanks for taking my call. Yes. Speaking of immunocompromised, I have a question for myself and many others I can't find any info on. What are the additional risk factors for somebody who has had their spleen removed? Well, you're at risk. <laughs> there's, there's not additional risk factors. You're at risk for developing um, severe complications uh, regardless of your age. So if you start coughing, if you have a fever, uh, call your doctor immediately. There's okay. not additional risk factors that come with it. You're already at risk. Gotcha. All right, Brian, thanks for the question. Appreciate it. I got an email question from Liz who wants to know uh, if we do have to go out to a store um, you know, we all know we're limiting our uh, our errands and our store uh, visits, but when we do go, what would you do differently, uh, doctor, just in terms of going in and out of, let's say, an HEB? I would, you know, avoid close contact with others when you go to HEB. We all have to do our shopping. Don't take a whole group of people along with you for shopping. If you can leave your kids at home or with somebody else while you go to the store, um, wipe down the cart when you walk in. They all have the wipes there for you. Um, be conscientious of what you're touching in the store. Don't put your hand on every package. Don't put your hand on every orange before you pick it. Uh, take just what you need um, and be aware of your surroundings so that you're not bumping into people. It's hard to say go at an uncrowded time because it's looking like they're crowded all the time, but hopefully that will settle down a little bit soon. Yeah, yeah. Another email question. This one is from Lisa. Um, 
and I think we know part of this answer already because I think the CDC has recommended not visiting uh, nursing homes and extended care facilities. What about visiting someone in the hospital? So I believe uh, a lot of hospitals have restricted visitors. I'm not sure if San Antonio hospitals have followed that. That might have changed today. So, of course, information is changing daily. Um, but it's not recommended. And I know that's very hard to not visit uh, somebody who's sick in the hospital. But if you might, you might be carrying the virus, you don't want to make somebody who's already sick even worse. And, you, and not right. just your relative, but anybody else in the hospital. All right. We're, uh, we're talking. Go ahead. Can I add, just add one more thing? Yeah, yeah. Hospitals are really, they're overwhelmed right now. It's yeah. not too bad here in San Antonio, but it's going to get there. So if you're not there because you're a critically ill patient, then stay away. Very good advice. Totally agree. Uh, just to reset here, we're talking with uh, an epidemiologist uh, and a doctor, Dr. Sharice Rohr Allegrini. We're taking calls for her. If you have a question about uh, yourself, about a family member, about something you heard but didn't understand, or you're confused about some of the guidance coming off of your uh, radio or your TV, 210 599 55. Now, a lot of kids are home. Uh, millions and millions of kids, of kids are home from school. And uh, that's just beginning here in San Antonio because last week was spring break. What about um, if your kids want to play with other kids or have a sleepover? What should you do? So that's such a tough one. I have two kids, and they, they have sleepovers almost every week. So we're not doing sleepovers. Um, we really want to avoid people getting together in groups. Um, I know that's really hard for kids. It depends a little bit on the age of your kids, too. If your kids are teenagers and they understand the six-foot distance and they understand not sharing drinks, then you're probably okay with one or two kids, provided that nobody has a fever and that the other parents understand the environment. So you don't have anybody who's at risk and they're not living with anybody who's at risk. For younger kids, like toddlers, it's, um, I, I would recommend not having yeah. um, play dates at all. Yeah, very good. Yeah, definitely. It, your advice is really the advice we have for all uh, sleepovers and play dates. You got to know what's right. going on at that other house uh, exactly. in every way. Uh, let me get to Frank here as a good question on line number one. Frank, you're on KTSA with the doctor. Yes, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I just had a question I heard today uh, that heat in excess of 50, 56 degrees Celsius or 133 degrees. Uh, would kill the virus in a few minutes. I don't know if that's true or not. They they gave some sort of a home remedy, remedy that you could do to kind of either in a sauna or uh, something to that effect. Is that is so, that is there any truth to that? It's a good question. Um, so the virus is killed at 132 132 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what. We've learned from um, some of the very recent research. However, uh, no, go, don't go in a sauna that's 132 degrees. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the thing to do. What you need to do to disinfect surfaces is to wipe things down. Um, and I would, right. I would recommend not going into a sauna right now anyway. You don't want to yeah. go into any place that, that other people have been. Yeah, because perspiration right, right. is not something you want to be around. Yeah, And that, that goes for working out in gyms and health clubs and things like that too, right? Yeah, that's tough. The gyms are still open. Um, I know my gym is still open, but they've issued some pretty significant protocols to really try to work on infection control. And reminder, their soap is up. They've got uh, disinfecting wipes everywhere. They're wiping them down constantly. Um, so I, I, I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to stay open, but you want to take extra precautions when you're there. All right. We're going to take a quick pause here, Frank. Thank you. And we're continuing our conversation with uh, an epidemiologist, and the San Antonio Program Director for the Immunization Partnership, Dr. Sheree Shroor Allegrini, is on our KTSA Kinetico Quality Water Softener Newsmaker line, giving us a big chunk of her time. And we're going to take as many calls and questions from you, also email questions as we can. Phone number is 210-599-5555. You can send me an email question to Jack at KTSA.com. And Daniel wants to know... Uh, Dr. Allegrini, about COPD, is that a higher risk? Uh, it, 
It's probably a higher risk, yes. Anything that's making it difficult for you to breathe anyway is going to put you at higher risk of becoming very ill. So the main risk factors are hypertension, coronary heart disease, and diabetes. Those are the things we found most common um, in the very sick patients. Um, But certainly uh, anybody who's a smoker, uh, somebody who has lung difficulties, is also going to be in that high-risk category. Now what do we understand about the contagiousness uh, uh, of this because we're hearing all kinds of things. We're hearing that people are carrying it but don't have symptoms. We're hearing that if you've been around someone and you decide to self-quarantine just as a precaution, how long does that have to be? How long do you need to stay in self-quarantine after you get better, as most people will? What do we know about it so far, knowing that what you tell us might change in the future? <laughs> Exactly. I'm glad you added that at the end because it is changing rapidly as we learn more. I'll start with the the relatively easy one of 14 days after exposure is the likely incubation period. Incubation is the time that it takes once the virus infects you until when you get sick. Um, Most people will be sick by day five. Um, Almost everyone will get sick by day 11 or so, and then there'll be a handful that might take up to 14 days to actually get sick and show symptoms. Um, So if you know you've been exposed, we say 14 days. If you can do longer, do longer, Um, but that's a minimum, 14 days. Now, contagiousness is one that's kind of tricky. Um, We call it the R naught value. It's how many people can I infect if I'm infected. For flu, that's about 1.2. For this virus, it's looking at to be about three. Okay, so it's a lot more infectious or contagious than flu virus is. Whether or not you have to have symptoms to be contagious is still up for debate. We know that on day five, after you start having symptoms, so you're already sick, that's when you're most contagious. You have the most virus being produced. But you can be shedding virus before the symptoms are obvious. So you might have just a little cough or a slight fever, and you're shedding virus. Now, you're shedding less. You're not as contagious as you are when you're really sick, uh, but you still could be shedding virus. And what does that mean, shedding virus? Okay, that means, so the virus enters your cell and reproduces, and then eventually it bursts out of the cell, and that's kind of why we call it shedding. It's, the virus is going out into the world because it's released from your cells, and it's in your cough, and when you cough, it's in little droplets. Um, so it's shedding. You're you're releasing virus. Um, so it's you have to have enough virus there for that to happen. So the day you're infected, assuming you know you know the day you were infected because you were with somebody who's positive, um, you're not going to be infectious yet. You won't be infectious for at least a few days. Exactly, okay. the time period is not clear yet. All right, let's go to line number two. Richard has a question for the doctor here on KTSa. Richard, go ahead. Yes, I subscribe to several uh, health-related email newsletters, and more than one has advocated, for example, high-dose vitamin C and elderberry to uh, strengthen the immune system. Uh, Is there anything to that? Um, Yes and no. Having vitamin C is is good for you. I'm not as familiar with elderberry. Um, I don't think that's enough. I don't think that's sufficient. You shouldn't rely on that to protect you. I think you really need to rely on limiting your social contact so that you're not exposed. All right, Richard, thank you for that. Let's go to line three for Larry on KTSA. Hi, Larry. How are you doing? We're doing good, Larry. What's your question? Well, my question is, you know, I don't know, it just seems like there's so much uh, uh, people are panicking, and then the question is, I haven't had a flu shot in 24 years. And we've had some of the worst strains and then not the worst strains and, uh, you know, and, and then I hear that, well, guess what? Uh, it's only 60% effective or 40% effective. And and then I'm hearing, yeah, okay, so, I mean, now corona. But it just... Again, that was that was my question. I haven't had uh, a, a flu shot in 24 years. I haven't had the flu. I've had people with flu all around me and stuff, and and for some reason I haven't gotten it. You know. So if I'm not okay, so what, what, shot, what is your so is your question about the about the coronavirus vaccine, or is your question about yeah. whether 
okay. the coronavirus vaccine that they're making versus what right. I took 20, I think 25 years ago, and I, I haven't taken okay. 24, and okay, sure. I'm well, just the, trying to make sense of it. So we don't have a coronavirus vaccine yet. We're working on it. Right. Hopefully we can get mm-hmm. it because it will limit the spread of disease. Flu vaccine is different, um, and I so I talk a lot about flu vaccine, and if you're one to play odds, do you want 60% protection or zero? I go for the 60%. I want a 60% chance that I'm not going to get sick. And also with flu, flu vaccine, even if you get infected and you do get sick, the disease is less worse. You're not going to be as sick as if you didn't have the vaccine. It's great you've never got the flu. You're one of the lucky ones that, that has never gotten it. Um, but we do know uh, one of the reasons we were able to slow down the spread of the H1N1 or swine flu pandemic in 2009 was because we were able to get a flu vaccine pretty quickly. Uh, now, flu vaccine is a little easier because we already had something similar. COVID vaccine is going to be a lot harder to produce. Um, but once we get it, it will help to slow the spread of disease. Um, you may not be the person that's going to be infected, um, but by getting the more people that get the vaccine, the less likely the disease will spread. Kind of a new normal we're all getting used to, and um, we're going to be uh, featuring on our show a lot of uh, different people who can answer questions you and I have about this coronavirus and living with it, working with it, uh, having the kids home, uh, taking care of each other, all the all the things we want to know and do to our best ability, and we're very privileged to have some time right now with Dr. Sharice Rohr Allegrini, uh, who is an epidemiologist, and we're taking calls for her at 210-599-5555, or if it's easier for you, you can shoot me an email, you can uh, direct message me on Facebook, and um, we'll get as many questions answered as we can. Um, and let me start with line two. And Harry with a question for the doctor here on KTSA. Harry, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon. Um, doctor, I had the, I guess you would call the American flu a couple weeks ago with some of the similar symptoms, and I'm fine now. I feel great. Does that help my immune system against this new strain of whatever's out there? Unfortunately not. They're very different viruses from different families. Um, so you won't really have any cross protection if you had the flu, uh, and you ha- and then you get infected with this. So you're still at risk of getting COVID. All right, thank you. Thank you, Harry. You know, one thing I've had a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people ask uh, Dr. Allegrini is whether or not they might already have had uh, a f- a form mm-hmm. of COVID nineteen and just didn't know. You know, some maybe a, a lesser case of it, and before we were all hyper aware of it, they might have chalked it up to a cold or or the regular flu, seasonal flu. Is it possible some people have already had this? It, it is possible. It's hard to know because we haven't been able to test. Um, in about uh, 70% of the people that get it, it's fairly mild, especially if you're younger and you're not uh, in one of the risk groups. Um, you might not know you have it, and you just feel kind of lousy or you think you have the flu. Um, so it's possible. We don't know that. The only way we're going to be able to find that out is to do antibody testing, and we, we don't have the resources to do that yet. Is it uh, the case that if I, you know, if I did have it and didn't know and just got over it at home or through home, you know, regular uh, home care, is it possible that I'm stronger in terms of resisting it uh, going forward? So, yes, in theory. We don't know that much about it yet, um, but in, in, most, in the case of most viruses, uh, once you're infected and your immune system responds, the next time it sees that virus, it responds right away so it attacks it before you get sick, before you can reproduce the virus. That's how vaccines work. Vaccines kind of trick your immune system into thinking it's already seen the virus and your body already has an immune response ready. It says, okay, I, oh, I know that cell. I'm going to attack it now. Whereas normally it doesn't know that until the virus has gotten so bad and your immune system says, oh, no, something new is here. I need to do something. Um, so in theory, yes, if you've already had COVID, you should be resistant to it again, um, but sometimes there's changes, and uh, I can't say that for 100% certainty at this point. Does that also mean that if this becomes a seasonal event, we might, as a population, be stronger in dealing with it? 
Uh, well, hopefully we're stronger because we'll, most of us will have already had it and won't be susceptible to it again. It's very different from flu. Flu strains change all the time um, because of the way their genome is set up. It's just a different virus. And so that's why we need to get a new vaccine for flu every year. Uh, but COVID um, is fairly uh, consistent. It doesn't have the same kind of genome. So we don't expect to see a different strain all the time. So um, next year, hopefully all this is said and done by then, um, we might see a little bit of it circulating, but most people are going to be, um, they won't be susceptible anymore because they've already had it. Because that kind of brings up the question of all these, uh, all these different things that are being postponed till later in the year. And I know you mm-hmm. can't possibly see into the future, and, and we can't, we, we're not in a position to judge all these things, but it seems like a lot of people are pinning their hopes on rescheduling things in the summer or even, for example, with Fiesta in the late fall. But, of course, the late fall will be a new flu season, right? It, it starts then. So typically we peak in San Antonio for flu in January and February, but we start seeing cases in October. So it's there, but usually at a low level. Um, however, uh, with H1N1, that was the pandemic we had in 2009, that started in April and we had a peak in September and early October. Uh, so we don't know if COVID is going to follow a similar pattern. Um, planning something September, October might be a little bit risky. And I think the hope is that by November uh, we'll be done with this, but flu season won't have kicked up yet and we'll be okay. We, we don't really know. Uh, we're hopeful. And if we end up having to cancel again, then, then we do that. The idea is that if you know everybody that's susceptible gets it or gets a mild case of it, the virus can't live anymore. It, it needs to pass from person to person. And if nobody is able to pass it, then the virus dies. This also works with social distancing. So with social distancing, what we're trying to say is we don't want you to get the virus. We want you to stay healthy. Um, so you're, you might still be susceptible to it in the future, but if we can get rid of it now, we can keep it at such low levels that it's not going to spread in the population. It's kind of what happened with SARS. Yeah. Boy, I'm rooting for that. I like what you just said there. Let's let's <laughs> definitely do that if we can. Uh, taking your calls at 210-599-5555 on KTSA San Antonio. Let me go to line two. This is a good question about being outside, and Ben is on the radio. Hi, Ben. Hi. I was wondering about uh, getting your opinion on like using getting exercise on a bicycle on the bike trails or the hiking trails. Um, is that safe or low risk? Oh, yeah. So, one, you know, being outside doesn't necessarily kill the virus, but it just being outside in open air, the, it'll disperse a little bit better. Um, but, it, you know, being outside on your bike, especially if you're by yourself, that's the same with social distancing. If you're with a friend, I would make sure that friend is about six feet away from you. Great. Thank you so much for your right. So, so no yeah. tightly clustered. And- don't, don't do the Tour de France, but... Uh- <laughs> that's right. Get out there and enjoy the good weather and get yeah. some great exercise. Because, you know, this is a good point um, we should make. It, people are being told stay home, but that doesn't mean stay in the house. You can go in your right. yard, right? Go outside, especially yeah. if you have kids. Let them run around and play outside. Go outside as much as you can. That that keeps you healthy. Unless, of course, you have really bad allergies. <laughs> and, you know, I was it. reading, and I don't know if this will be the case here, but they found during the uh, the great Spanish flu epidemic 100 years ago, they wound up taking a lot of patients outside for, for to, to enjoy sunlight because they oh. felt that it had a beneficial, the fresh air and the sunlight had a beneficial effect on them that they couldn't get in the hospital wards. Yeah, there, there's still some debate about whether or not that was strictly medical or if it was, um, you know, just being out in the fresh air makes you feel better. Right. It's not that the sun, sunlight didn't have a direct impact on the virus, but when you're, you're in an enclosed area, the virus kind of sits there longer. If you're outside, it gets dispersed more. And you feel talk- I know when I'm sick, I'm oh, yeah. outside. I mean, if it helps you feel better, even if it's not making you better, sometimes that's a that's a good shot in the arm. But what about let's talk about like surfaces? Because I'm a germaphobe by nature. I mean, I'm all, I'm looking at everything in my world uh, even before this as a you know a potential battlefield. But I've seen right. people putting on gloves to pump gasoline, and you know how how far would you take something like that? So I don't recommend using gloves for all those 
things because really we need to keep the gloves for the healthcare workers that really need it or sometimes the store workers because they're they're handling a lot of stuff all the time and we want to keep those people safe as possible there's only a limited supply out there um, so I don't recommend it for that reason the other thing with gloves is that we tend not to use them right if we're not the people that use them regularly. So you actually have to take the, put them on and take them off in a certain way. And if you don't do it right, whatever's on the glove kind of splatters or you know, goes into the air. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're not necessarily protecting yourself. You're better off having some hand sanitizer handy. Uh, if you can't get to a, a sink to wash your hands right away, have some hand sanitizer handy and just put that on your hands right afterwards. Or taking a Clorox wipe mm-hmm. if you have it and wiping that. Or a rag. You know, take a rag, put it down there. Make sure the rag is, you know, you put it in a bag and then you throw it in the laundry if, if you're really concerned about it. When you use hand sanitizer, is there any um, residue that stays on your hands that's positive? In other words, have you just made your hands uh, more resistant to the next thing you touch? No, not really. You're just getting off what's already there. Yeah. So it'll dry out your hands. Soap and water is the best, but hand sanitizer is the next best thing. And they say that, uh, and correct me if I have this wrong, soap and water is superior to hand sanitizer because it actually lifts the dirt off the skin, which can be a a place where uh, something would settle or, or anchor onto you, right? That, that's correct. And you need to have the soap. The soap is a critical part of that. Yeah. So, and the water should be warm, but it doesn't need to be super hot. The warm water helps to set up the soap, which helps to remove the dirt. All right, let's talk to Jane on line number one with a question for Dr. Sharish Rohr Allegrini, who's an epidemiologist joining us here on KTSA. Jane, what's your question? Do we have line one? Do we have Jane? Nope. Okay. Let's move on to line number two then. And Ruben with a question for the doctor here on KTSA. Hi, Ruben. Hello, how you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Good, good. I just had a real quick question. If I was physically strong enough to survive the flu, does that mean that my odds of surviving corona are pretty good also? Um, if you are a young, healthy adult, your odds are in your favor uh, for both the flu and the COVID uh, disease. Uh, that's not a guarantee. COVID is actually a lot worse in some people. And, it, you know, even healthy folks are, are getting very sick. Um, that tends to be more in healthcare workers who get a higher dose of the virus typically. Um, but I, I can't say you, you, you were fine with the flu, you're going to be fine with COVID. I can't really say that, but I can say that if you're a young, healthy adult, um, your the odds are in your favor. Okay, All thank right. you. But, Ruben, thanks for that question. Um, I think a lot of people are trying to figure out, I mean, you can hear it in our callers, right, Doctor? Uh, they're right. trying to figure out, what does this mean to me? What, 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 what can I glean from my own, maybe my own history or my own ha- habits that will tell me what to expect? And nobody can tell them with crystal ball right. precision what to expect. But what are some other things that people should be doing in their daily routine that would make them either more resistant or stronger if they got it? Well, I mean, just staying healthy in general is going to, you know, eat well, eat your fruits and vegetables, um, make sure you're in good shape. Um, Those are things. Keep your blood pressure low. Um, If you have blood pressure problems, make sure you're taking your medicine. So we know that diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease are big risk factors. Um, So uh, if those are risk factors already for you, make sure you're working with your doctor um, to take the appropriate medication to keep you healthy um, and eat right and do the things that you need to do to not get those diseases. Um, But I also want to say that it's not just about me, it's about everybody else. So even if I have an 80% chance of being fine, I could be giving it to somebody who's not going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important that we all protect ourselves because we don't want to be vectors of the disease. Right, right. Good point. 210-599-5555 is the number, or you can send me an email, jack at ktsa.com. Let's go to line number four and pick up Glenn with a question for Dr. Allegrini. Glenn, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Hello, Donna. Thank you. Hi. Um, doctor, hi. I'm wondering, um, I've heard other scientists in, uh, allude to the role of ACE2 receptor sites in the lungs having something to do with the severity of COVID-19 and or ethnicity because uh, the number of ACE2 receptor sites varies from race to race. 
and that this that this could account for uh, the severity of of the disease and or racial, you know, uh, involvement. Are you aware of any of this? Vaguely, and I'm not going to have a good answer for you, and I'm going to go look it up as soon as we're done. I, I know there was some talk about that. I would, from, from the responses I saw, um, there's not really substantial uh, racial variation. I think they thought that might be because there were so many deaths in China at first, um, but we're also seeing so many deaths in Italy. Um, and in China, it appears that the, the people that were dying, in addition to being older, um, there are a lot of men who were smokers, and being a smoker is a risk factor. Um, so they had a higher population that were vulnerable. Um, similarly, in Italy, it first impacted um, an older population who were high risk to begin with and the social dynamics of that population, you know, the way people live, the way they socialize, the old folks in Italy hang out together every day. They socialize all day. It's a wonderful community environment, but it also created um, higher risks because they're spreading the disease. And these are people that are already medically fragile. So it doesn't look like there's any ethnic variation in, um, in this, uh, but I'll look into it further. I don't have a strong answer for you at the moment. All right. Good question, though. Appreciate that. Uh, We're spending a little uh, more time here with Dr. Sharice Rohr Allegrini uh, and answering your questions. And line number two, Mike uh, has a question here on KTSA. Mike, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, I work in a, I'm a inspector. So I have to go in people's homes, outside and inside, uh, without wearing a mask, which is it just doesn't look right. How how at risk am I? So um, if you could give a little more detail. So what do you do when you go inside the home? Are you interacting with the person there? Yes, uh, initially. <laughs> then I'm kind of on my own doing whatever I need to do. So we'll probably uh, recommend limiting any contact with other individuals. Um, your, your risk is really getting in close contact with another person. So if you can Pretty do your close. work with, um, so without knowing exactly what you do in terms of inspection, um, you know, if you can stay six feet away from the person, then you're probably fine. You might want to make sure you wash your hands if you touch any surfaces, have, um, have hand sanitizer available and wipes um, as well. Um, but breathing-wise, if you can stay six feet away, and six feet is actually not that much. You can do six feet pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, what if they're shaking your hand? <laughs> Tell them not to That's shake hands. That's the normal way to do it. Yeah. So it, not, it is not I the new normal. So we a lot of people are learning now not to do it. And the first thing I do when I walk up, I know you somebody sticks their hand out, and I say I'll put my hands up like a in theater we call it jazz hands. <laughs> put my hands up, and I say I'm not shaking hands. I'm just waving. And uh, it's it's hard because it's instinctual, but you don't have to do it. That's not part of the the requirements of your work to shake hands. You need to tell them we're not shaking hands today. I'm just going to wave high, and I'm going to keep this distance for your safety as well as mine. Yeah, yeah. All right, Mike, that's a, that's a great question, though, and that applies to so many people, not only home inspectors like Mike, but you think about uh, sure. people in the service uh, industry, people who sure. are delivering uh, things, and there's going to be a lot more of that. And I think a lot of companies are actually telling people what to expect in advance, like, hey, we can still come to your home, but here's what we're going to do for your protection and for ours, and that's just something we have to get used to. Right. We just have to plan for it. There's a lot of fun things that we're trying out with greetings, you know, bumping elbows or uh, tapping feet or doing a bow. All those things are acceptable. I know it's not the norm. You're not used to it. But you can you can be the, the leader in, the, in making the change. All right. Adrian on line number one is on KTSA. Adrian, how you doing? Hey, Jack. How you doing? Got a question for the doctor about our immune system. She talks about uh, eating fruits and vegetables. Can she be more specific as far as a diet? Should it be a high-protein, low-carb diet? Should it involve water, uh, multivitamins, sleep, exercise? Um, also, um, can our house be too clean? You know, is, is there a healthy amount of germs that we should have in our house? Um, I, I changed out my air filter at my house already, you know, twice this month. And, you know, is, is there a way to be too clean, you know, in this? 
So there are a couple of different questions there. Um, beginning, you know, diet wise, it's a balanced, healthy diet. Um, so not any of the fad diets Just follow a balanced, healthy diet. You're getting your regular meals uh, when you need to, not high in fat. You don't want to overdo the protein, but protein's important. You want to make sure you have a lot of fiber. You know, those are the things that we recommend every day, all the time. That's how we need to live. Um, regarding being too clean. There's definitely the idea that um, not all germs are bad for us. We, we need to have a functioning immune system. Our immune system needs to know how to respond. Um, I would be more concerned with public places where you're interacting with other people. If you're in your home and it's just you and your family, um, you'll want to clean down surfaces, but I don't think you need to be uh, following your kid out of everywhere, wiping down the surface after they leave because you're still going to be interacting with your kid. Um, so cleaning things normally. Um, I, I'm not sure that, you know, too clean, that's, some people are excessive about it. Some people are kind of happy to not. But um, your real issue is the interaction with others. If you're in that breathing space, um, you can get it from them. That's a great okay. uh, question, though, Adrian. Thanks for that. And let me just follow up on one thing he mentioned, uh, Doctor, and that is the furnace filters or air filters in our home. If they're not due to be changed, should we be changing them now anyway? No. So this virus does not appear to be airborne. It's droplet transmission, and that's, that's important. So we, we're still learning, and this might change, uh, but droplet transmission means it's sort of when you cough up, there's, or even when you're talking, there's a little bit of spit that comes out, and it may not even be noticeable. That's, that's droplet, and it'll contain virus. But it doesn't float through the air. Uh, for example, measles, which has a very, very, very high contagious rate, that's airborne. It can live in the air and land on surfaces and be in that air for a long time. Um, so I don't think you need to go overboard in changing your air filters because that's not going to filter out the virus. Okay. What you do want to do is have clean air filters because that's good for your overall breathing and lung health. And what about... Um in terms of keeping a clean home and wipe, you know, we're wiping down surfaces kind of as we see them or as we think of them, but is there any uh -huh. parts of the home that we really need to be most mindful of? Like if you're saying it's something that, that we can expectorate, should we be cleaning our sinks more often in the bathroom or, or what? You should be, if you're coughing, you should be coughing into a tissue or into your arm and then wash your clothes. You don't have to take your clothes off every time you cough into your arm, but um, that's if you're sick. You know, if you're sick and you, you're you um, coughing onto something, you want something you can dispose of. So tissue works good or a napkin or something like that. Um, I, I don't think you need to be um, heavily focused on one part of your house. Now, if you're in isolation because you are known contact to a case, then um, you want to stay away as much as possible from the rest of the people in your house. And that might be when a mask is helpful. So okay. wearing a mask when you are in contact because you have to go to the bathroom. So it's different if you have somebody in your household that's infected. But if so far nobody's infected and we know of nobody being exposed in your household, going about your normal life is probably sufficient. Now, I know we're just about out of time, but I want to kind of ask a general question because we got a lot of these. A uh, ton of people have asked basically the same question. They are senior citizens. They want to know whether or not they can spend time with grandkids, and if so, what they should do. So, you know, it's better to limit it, and I know that's, that's so hard for so many folks. Um, they want to be with their grandkids. Many grandparents take care of their grandkids. It we're not sure what the role of children is yet in transmitting. We know that children don't get very sick. And at least the early studies showed that they were more likely to get infected from the adults in their house than the other way around. So the kids weren't giving it to the parents. The parents were giving it to the kids. That said, um, anybody elderly, as most grandparents are, are going to be in a high-risk group. And so they don't want to take that chance. So they're better off keeping a distance um, with their grandkids. You know, if you don't have Skype, learn how to Skype, get someone to set up Skype for you or FaceTime or any of the electronic means, um, write letters to each other, um, those things that you can do that can avoid that face-to-face -face contact in the short term would be best for, the, for the, our older folks. All right. Dr. Allegrini, you've been wonderful. I know we've learned a lot here, and we appreciate the time, and I hope we can call on you again in the days ahead and do more of this. But thank you so much for the time today. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great talking to you all.